So we've been studying the book of Revelation, and we're in number 19 of this study. And we've, I've, I'm, personally, I've learned a lot of stuff. And one of the big themes in this book and in the Bible is the spirit of Babylon. Really, Babylon contrasts God's city, Jerusalem. Babylon was a city, and it represents terrible things. But we're going to talk about the spirit of Babylon. What does that look like? So if you're asking, man, what are some recent events of how I can understand how the spirit of Babylon works? Because the thing about the spirit of Babylon it represents a global wickedness, a rebellion against God. But here's, here's an, an event, some events that's happened in recent history that I believe kind of shows us the spirit of Babylon raising its head. Like, for example, World War I and World War II, tremendous times in our history, terrible times in our history. But in those times, you had freedom fighting against tyranny, correct? In recent history, 2020, I guess we got our 2020 vision. I think the first time in a long time we saw the world heading in the same direction. That is the spirit of Babylon. And here's what the world was saying. You will shut down your, your dog, I can't even say. <laughs> shut down your economies. Thanks, Levi. He's going to be a preacher. Man. Shut down your economies. You better wear masks. And I'm not against, well, I'll say this. You better get shots. I'm not condemning people that's got shots. I'm just saying the demand, the direction, global direction. You better do this. You better get the mask on or else if, if you don't have this stuff, guess what? You can lose your job. And a lot of people lost their jobs because they didn't want to get it. Oh, here's another thing. We will force upon you as much as we can, perversion. The whole world. I mean, seriously, you got, even in the Olympics, you got dudes being allowed to participate in girls' events. I don't know, but you talk about fairness. Is that fair? (laughs) <laughs> but the whole world is going that direction. You have parents showing up at school board meetings. Like, hey, th- this material you've got in your libraries is crazy. And our government calls some of those parents terrorists. That is the spirit of Babylon. And I really believe God wants us to to know how it operates. It's just kind of like frog in a kettle, right? Because Jesus says something here, Revelation 18, 4 through 5. Come out. Come out of her. Talking about Babylon. Come out of her, my people so that you will not share in her sins. So that you will not receive any of her plagues. For her sins, I've never seen this before. For her sins, talking about the spirit of Babylon, for her sins are piled up to heaven. And God has remembered her crime. Crimes against God, crimes against humanity, the spirit of Babylon. 
And here it talks about share. And it has the word uh, quantania, sin quantan, sin quantanio. And let's just focus on, so sin quantanino is a term that people use in Greek for a partnership, a business partnership. Jesus said, don't be intermingled with the world that it's like you're doing business with them. Let's look at this word. I think it's, I have it on the slide, quantania, because Jesus told us to get out of this system. Don't be influenced by this system. Quantania means close relationships, par- participating and sharing and common among a group of people, communion, communication and fellowship, sharing and intimacy. Jesus told us, get out. And like I said, with the frog in the kettle, sometimes if the frog knew what was going on in that pot, the frog would have got out. But sometimes we can get so comfortable in our environments that we don't realize that things are around us is not our friend. So Jesus is telling us to get out. So there's. Three particular stories in the Old Testament that really show what the spirit of Babylon is. Let's go to the first one. Genesis 3, 1 through 7. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say? Whoa. So that's the first thing. Satan wants to challenge the authority of God's word. He wants to bring doubt. Did God really say a marriage was between one man and one woman? Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the tree in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that you, when you eat of, eat of it, your eyes will be opened. I believe that's the first mention of wokeness. <laughs> Their eyes will be open to what? Fear and all the bad stuff. Their eyes will be opened to try to interpret what's going on in reality just by themselves, just by their own intellect. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. Well, newsflash. They already were like God. They were made in his image. Can I get an amen? Amen. Satan is lying. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit, the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some of it and ate. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were woke and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Part of the songs that we, we sang today, we talked about God's glory, didn't we? Ever since that day in history, Man has been seeking glory, the wrong glory, because we lost God's glory. God's glory was so magnificent, we wore it as clothes to the point where we didn't know we needed. We didn't need clothes because God's clothes, his glory covered us. And oftentimes people are looking for glory. They're looking for things. Everywhere. They're looking for that, looking for their own glory. And what we need to do is seek God's glory. Can I get an amen? amen? We need to seek God's glory. 
But you see there, they covered themselves. But a little bit later in this chapter, God covers them with what he wanted to cover them with. And it had to do with blood. You notice there, it talked about you will be able to know good and evil. See, here's what happened. Eve was deceived. We're talking about the spirit of Babylon. Eve was deceived. Adam was not. And what, he, what Adam was, basically what he was signing on for is, well, I can make my own value system. I can make my own laws. I can make basically my own religion. I can do my own thing. What he said was, just like Nimrod, like we're going to talk about a little bit later, I don't need your authority, God. I don't need your power, God. I can do my own thing. I can create my own religious system like they did when they clothed themselves with leaves. I can do that myself. That there is a picture of the spirit of Babylon. It's a spirit of rebellion, and it's a spirit that says, I'm going to figure out my own religious system and how I get to God and how I'm okay. So that's the first story, Adam and Eve. Here's the next story. Everybody remember Cain and Abel? All right, let's read that. Now Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. But Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel in his offering. That's key. But on Cain in his offering, he did not look with favor. Why didn't he? So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. Here's our gracious father. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do, if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your, at, at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. God is trying to tell Cain, hey, buddy, you can overcome this. You, this sin doesn't have to rule your life. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. What happened with Cain? Well, evidently, because in Hebrews, in Hebrews 11, it says Abel offered his sacrifice with faith. Faith is based on God's word. That means we have instructions. Faith is following God's instructions, even when it doesn't make sense. So obviously, Abel had the instructions and followed it. Cain created his own religion in his own eyes, wanted to give crop. I believe God told him, it's the lamb. It's the blood sacrifice that I, I want. That's, that's what I want. Cain rebelled against that and tried to come up with his own system. And he got mad at God for not accepting his own system that he created. That's another picture of the spirit of Babylon. We know what to do, but we decide, well, I just want to go my own way. So let's talk about with the flood. So before the flood, it was really bad. Everybody say really bad. <laughs> it was really bad. The Bible talked about that humanity all the time had evil in their thoughts. They didn't think good except Noah and his family. So it was really bad. So bad. Evil, demonic activity was so bad that God said we need to we need to press the reset button. So he did. And that was part of God's mercy and grace. 
So then you have the flood that covered the whole world. It, the, it said that the flood covered the whole world 20 feet above the highest mountain. Is that not high? It was catastrophic. And I believe it. And, and what you read in Genesis, it, it kind of imp- implies that all the land was not separated. It was in one piece. But when the flood, it said the fountains of the deep came and broke up water from the bottom, from from beneath and water from from the sky. And if you look, we're talking about this in Equip Night. If you look at the at at, at a map, it looks like a puzzle. It looks like it was broke open. Catastrophic. And. When they got from the flood. It was Noah and his three sons and their wives. So you would think they would have learned a lesson. But two generations after the flood, Nimrod. So it's it's just like my father-in-law's mom, Grandma Betty. My kids know Grandma Betty. Two generations. They knew Noah. Even after the flood, Noah was alive, and during Nimrod, when he was doing his building projects, Noah was alive. But somehow he thought he had a better idea than God. I wonder why they didn't learn the lesson (laughs) from what happened before the flood. I'm like, good, two generations. Let's just read about these, these, these generations. The son of Noah who came out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These were the three sons of Noah, and from them came the people who were scattered over the earth. That showed you there, too, that it's just a human race. It's one race. Amen. Right? We've been taught all this craziness. From those three boys came the whole world that we see. The sons of Ham was Cush. So Canaan, from Canaan came Ham. So these are the sons of Ham. Cush, Miserim, Put, and Canaan. Uh, the, the, yeah, the sons of Cush, Seba, all those folks. Cush was the was a father of Nimrod. Remember, two generations who grew to be a mighty warrior on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Scholars say that wasn't that he was just hunting animals. He was hunting the souls of men. Scholars say Nimrod was the first emperor. This dude was a mean, he was not, his name actually means rebel. He was ruthless. It really gives you a picture of the Antichrist that at one time in his, and time in the future, Antichrist will be hunting down the souls of men. Mighty hunter before the Lord, the first centers of his king, of, of his kingdom. This guy was a building machine. Of his kingdom were Babylon, Erech, Akkad, Kela, and Sinar. From the land he went to Assyria where he built Nineveh. He was a building machine. Uh, Rehoboth, Ur, Kela, and Rizin, which is between Nineveh and Kela, and that is the great city. So two generations this is what we get, Genesis 11, 1, 8. And this is from the TLB translation. I, I thought it read pretty well. At that time, all mankind spoke a single language. As the population grew and spread eastward, a plain was discovered in the land of Babylon. Probably in your Bible it says Shinar, but it's actually Babylon. And was soon thickly populated. The people who lived there began to talk about building a great city. So there's three parts to this. Great city, that talks about they had their own politics. 
build a great city with a temple tower. That's religion. They had their own religious system. Reaching to the skies, a proud eternal monument to themselves. This will weld us together, they said, and keep us from scattering all over the world. So they made great piles of hard brick, hard burned brick, and collected betumen to use as mortar. So here's the first thing that we see. This is unheard of. Using brick was unheard of. Because they were in the desert, they didn't have much rock. So they used sand, mud, to make brick. And that's a, that, the picture you get there is the counterfeit. They weren't using what was real. Like They usually used rock. But that was a counterfeit. and collected bitumen to use as mortar. But when God came down to see the city, and we'll see a little later that the the Tower of Babel was called, it was known as to the Babylonians as the gate to the gods. The gate of God. And there's one, one translation of the, what, what they saw this Tower of Babel as, it was the, the foundation between heaven and earth, this Tower of Babel. So check this out. If it was so amazing and so big, why did God have to come down from heaven and check out what was going on? It just shows how sometimes our pride is just, we don't realize how not smart we are, Right? He said, look, if they are able to accomplish all this when they have just begun to exploit their linguistic and political unity, just uh, think of what they will do later. Nothing will be unattainable for them. Come, let us go down and give them different languages so that they won't understand each other's words. So in, in that way, God scattered them all over the earth and that ended the building of the city. So how do we get different languages? How do we get different languages? Because of rebellion. Say again. Because of God. And before that, it's because of our rebellion. It's why we have different languages. So that means instantly, instantly, they got different languages. It, was, it wasn't like an evolution. The, the, the languages, languages do change. Go ahead. Right. right. So he, he, he gave them, I think scholars believe it was 60 different languages he gave. And that right there stopped the project that they had. But we're going to see later on that King ne- ne- Nebuchadnezzar is going to re-erect that plan. Here's another thing about the Spirit of Babylon. It gets knocked down, but it, it, it somehow comes back. Like weeds. Seriously. So here was, the, here was part of the problem. Here was the problem. Is that after Noah got off the ark, God said, I'm going to bless you. And this is what you wanted, I want you to do. I want you to spread over and fill the earth with my glory. That's what God said. So actually what these people were doing was the opposite. Let us come together. They were, they were being rebellious. So I have some pictures. Um, okay, let's read that first. I'm sorry. What does Nimrod in the Tower of Babel represent? An effort to usurp and defy God's authority on earth. An effort to cast God out of the earth and institute the government of man. A global unification of rebellion against God. And a rebellious Humanistic worldview, what does humanistic mean? Man says, I'm my, I'm my own God. Yeah. I do my own thing. I make my own laws. That's what Adam did at the beginning. That's what Cain did. An effort to uh, uh, things, oh. 
an effort to do things in their own name instead of God's name. They wanted to do things not in God's name, not for God's glory, but their own glory. An effort to re- regain the glory mankind, mankind lost in the Garden of Eden by their own intelligence and strength. An effort to establish their own rules to get to heaven. So I have some pictures here, I think. Yeah. So here, this is what's called a ziggurat. Everybody say ziggurat. Yeah. <laughs> this is... This is how the Tower of Babel looked. I promise you. Go to the next picture. This is in uh, this is in Ur. Papa, have you seen that? Did you see that before? No. No. He's been all over the Middle East, so I was wondering. <laughs> but this is actual an uh, actual one, and it's called a temple tower. Temple tower. The the tower and the temple sat on the top, and right here the 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 temple is missing on the top there. Next, next one. Here's another vantage point. So this is the one in Earth. Next one. Here's the same one. See how little the people are? <laughs> next one. So that's the one on the left is actually the size of the one in Earth, of the ziggurat. The one that they were building in Babylon with Nimrod was that big. Massive. Go to the next slide. So this was what they called it. Oh, Itime Atinamaki. Woo! Gee, Willikers. Yeah. This is Babylonian language. Go to the next slide. It meant the house that is the foundation of heaven and earth. You see what they're doing? They're creating their own religion. They're creating their own stairway to heaven. You ever heard that song? Anyway. All right, go to the next one. This is how tall, as as tall, almost as tall as the Statue of Liberty, this is how tall they were trying to build the Tower of Babel. Mm -hmm. Next one. So this is actually in Babylon. This is where they were trying to build the Tower of Babel. This is it. This is the foundation. That is it. And we'll see in scripture a little later why it's basically desolate. Go to the next. You see see right there in the bottom, it's going down like that. That was the actual stairs that went up to their temple tower. That's in Babylon. Next slide. So the dimensions of the Tower of Babel was 90 meters, 90 meters all the way around, and 90 meters up. Huge. Keep going. Yep, keep going. So Nebuchadnezzar came and finished the project. It was a glorious kingdom. Keep going. Yep. Their, their walls were 300 feet high and, and about 80, 85 feet thick, so wide that a four-horse chariot can turn all the way around. Keep going. So this is interesting. This was the entrance, the entrance of their, their front gate going into the kingdom. This was the gate of Shinar. Not the gate of Shinar. The gate of Ishtar. the gate of Ishtar. And we're going to see a little later that they had another little temple that they created and made for Marduk. You heard of him? You heard of him? And, say again? No, Marduk was like Baal. So in Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom, it's kind of trying to show you that it's the same spirit. This, is, this was the gate of Ishtar. So you had that influence, like uh, Aphrodite or um, Venus or Diana. The same spirit. Same spirit here. They had this huge, amazing gate. And all the way down the pathway going in there was beautiful rock. And there was this German archaeologist that actually went and got the rock. 
And I believe that's part of the rock that this German got, and they positioned it in, in Germany, in Berlin, Germany. Keep going. Keep going. So this is the, the archaeologist from Germany that went down to Babylon, grabbed some of the tile, and this is what they're able to build. Next slide. See, this is the actual rock from Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar, on the, the gate of Ishtar. Keep going. And this is, that was, this is the reconstructed pathway to the front gate. And all those walls were blue and had those lines on it. The gate of Ishtar. Keep going. That's another picture of it going inside. Actual brick from Nebuchadnezzar. Keep going. So this is Marduk. And it was a 22-ton gold statue that they had in this little temple. But Marduk is also known as Baal. So we're talking about the spirit of Babylon. And what we've been learning about Baal, some things we're picking up in our equip nights, is that one of the things that Baal does, he causes God's people to forget God. And that's actually one of the strategies and purposes of the spirit of Babylon. It wants God's people to forget God. You don't need God. You can do your own thing. So my question, why do we have cigarettes all around the world? Did you know we had cigarettes all around the world? Yeah, that's the one from South America. Because when God gave those different languages, some of the people kept that spirit of Babylon and they tried to recreate what was going on in the plains of Shinar. Here's another one. It wasn't cool what was going on in there. Next one. And here's just a picture of all these ziggurats. And the original plan came with Nimrod and those people. Keep going. Here's a little thing. Um, we, we took a picture at the Creation Museum. That's the Tower of Babel. And when God gave them different languages, that's how they split up. And as they split up, they recreated, tried to do a replica of those ziggurats. OK, keep going. This is talking about how the spirit of Babylon has even gotten into science and technology. In Genesis 11, however, however the tower in the land of Shinar is a monument to ambitious technolo te technological man who has lost touch with the ways of God. The brick and the bitumen are there for us to build up power structures of our own. It reminds us that when technology ceases to be our servant, it very quickly becomes our master. And human communities and human uh, values are all too often casualties. Science, as a quest for truth, is now frequently getting swallowed up by technology. What is truth gets taken over by what is useful. It blows my mind what some the Canadian government are doing to their people it, in the name of science. R research money is provided for particular projects which fit in with certain political ideologies. Technique and skill become more important than understanding or wisdom. And when uh, what becomes and, and then what becomes of science? The research chemist Walter Thorson wrote some years ago, having finally understood that scientific truth is a source of power, man has made the crucial decision that from now on the will to power and the uses of power should dictate the relevance and value of that truth. Because of that decision, pure science, the science of the past 400 years, will begin to be altered in subtle ways and will eventually disappear. If Thorson is right in this, it means that when we are often seeing in our scientific research programs uh, is effectively a cost-benefit manipulation of truth for the sake of practical or political usefulness. 
The fusion of science and technology means that increasingly the moral decision as uh, to the uses of truth will be made uh, preemptively before the truth itself is even sought. We shall seek only truth which fits our purposes. Uh, technological pride coupled with political will and an abandonment of the ways of God is not only a tale told in Genesis 11, it is part of our world too, and we are part of the story. Let us build ourselves a city. Let us build ourselves a tower with its top in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves. So on your sheet, here's an acronym. I'm going to try to go really quick. These are some more aspects of the spirit of Babylon. Ready? All right, here we go. The first B stands for, it's the basis for all evil spirits and false religions. Check out Revelation 18, 2 through 3. Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. Talking about that spirit. Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a home for demons and a haunt for for every evil spirit, a haunt for every unclean and detestable bird. For all the nations have drunk the maddening wine of her, of her adulteries. The kings of the earth committed adultery with her, and the merchants of the earth grew rich from her excessive luxuries. But notice it talked about the home for demons. Talking about the spirit. Revelation 17, 1 through 5. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to, come, said, come to me. Come, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits on many waters. Many waters in the Bible, oftentimes, right here, it means a lot of people. Many waters. With her, the kings of the earth committed adultery, and the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries, then the angel carried me away in the spirit into a desert. There I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names. Covered with blasphemy. It represents all the false religions that we have in the world. And had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and was glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. Here's another thing about the spirit of Babylon. It loves materialism. It loves wealth and it loves deceiving people with those things. Man, you take a look at some of these awards, music awards and movie awards and what the what you're hearing about what these people are doing to get their fame. Some of them have confess on the internet that they've given their soul, their soul over to the devil exactly. for fame. That is the spirit of Babylon. The woman was dressed purple and scarlet and was glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. She held a golden cup in her hand filled with abominable, abominable, that means disgraceful, dirty things in the filth of her adulteries. This title was written on her forehead. Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes. That gives you a, a kind of a picture, too, of being taken advantage of, being lied to. Prostitutes in of the abominations, abominations of the earth. And Carolyn gave me a something, uh, a news article talking about the uh, Abrahamic family house. Have you heard about that? I'm not going to read it all. But basically, it's a house that they have special services and joint services with Muslims, Christians, and uh, who else was it? Muslim, Christians. Huh? Yeah, and Jews. Right here in this Abrahamic family house, they're already starting this one world religion. Here's A, it attacks God's people. Revelation 17, 6, I saw the woman was drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of those 
who bore testimony to Jesus. When we're studying one of the churches, this is what it said. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful even to the point of death and I will give you the crown of life. And here's some encouragement. Even connecting to what Miss Teresa said earlier about focusing on victory. If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hates me first. It hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. And the world there is talking about the Babylon spirit, the Babylon system. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. Can I get an amen? Woo! That is why the world hates you. Remember the words I spoke to you. No servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, and a lot of them didn't, they will obey yours also. They will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. A, attacks God's people. B, based on counterfeit and deception. We talked about the bricks. That was unheard of. It was counterfeit. Revelation 18, 21 to 24. Then a mighty angel uh, picked up a boulder the size of a large millstone and threw it into the sea. This is talking about God's wrath later. We're not going to be here. <laughs> With such violence, the great city of ba Babylon will be thrown down, never to be found again. Now check out all the influence that the Revelation talks about here. The music of harpists and musicians, flute players and trumpeters will never be heard in you again. So what is that saying? And we have music and things that's influenced and inspired by this bad spirit. No workman of any trade will be found in you again. The sound of a millstone will never be heard in you again. The light of a lamp will never shine in you again. The voice of the bridegroom and bride will never be heard in you again. You merchants were the world's greatest men. By your magic spell, all the nations were led astray. In her was found the blood of prophets and of the saints and of all those who have been killed on the earth. Deception. And again, with how the... the, the the, the picture of, of this woman with all the nice pearls and gold and all this stuff is a picture of worldliness and materialism. Why? Yearning for power and control. That's the letter Y. Yearning for power and control. So we know about the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And... King Nebuchadnezzar was really feeling himself. He made a golden statue um, of himself. And he said, hey, when the music starts, everybody in the whole world, because it was a world power at the time, everybody in the whole world needs to bow down. Something about this spirit that I believe is cl closely connected to the, the communist spirit hates freedom. It wants control. So when you think about the Babylonian spirit, it's a global system and spirit that wants to control the earth. Here, at Revelation 13, 15 through 18, he was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast so that it could speak and cause all who refuse to worship the image to be killed. He also forced everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on his right hand or on his forehead so that no one could buy or sell unless he had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of his name. This is called for wisdom. If anyone has insight, let him calculate the number of the beast for, it's, for it is man's number. His number is 666. That also represents the, the unholy trinity 
of the Antichrist, the false prophet, and the spirit of Babylon. Um, why is the number for man six? Yep. We were created on the sixth day. Day six. All right. We'll keep going. L. It lacks value for mankind. Now, this one right here, when I read this, I was like, what? Revelation 18, 11 through 13. The merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her because no one buys their cargoes anymore. Cargoes of gold, silver. This this passage here is talking about things that the Babylon spirit bought. Cargoes of gold, silver, precious stones and pearls, fine linen, purple, silk, scarlet cloth, every sort of citron wood and articles of every kind of uh, kind made of ivory, costly wood, bronze, iron, marble, cargoes of cinnamon and spice, of incense, myrrh, frankincense, of wine and olive oil, of the fine flour and wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and car carriages, in bodies and souls of men. Opposes God's word and law. We already talked about how Nimrod went the opposite direction of what God was telling him to do. And the last one, never gives God glory. Never gives God glory. So let me give some encouragement really quick for those S's. There is a person in the Bible that overcame this Babylonian spirit. Who can tell me? There are at least four people in the Bible that talks about that overcame this Babylon spirit. Who can tell me who it is? Who they were? Who? Who can tell me? Daniel. Shadrach, Meshach, yep. Yep. And, <laughs> and Abednego. And this is three things that I believe they did that we can do to overcome this spirit. God, Jesus told us to get out of it. This is things that, can, that we can do to be strong. We need to spend time in prayer. Can I get an amen? amen? We need to spend time in prayer. Daniel 6, 8 through 12. Now, O king, issue the decree and put it in writing so that it cannot be altered in accordance with the laws of the uh, Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed. So King Darius put the decree in writing. Now, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. These men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. So they went to the king and spoke to him about his royal decree. Did you not publish a decree that during the next 30 days, anyone who prays to any God or man except you, O king, will be thrown into the lion's den? And we know that Daniel's prayer life helped to save him. Oh, oh, man. OK. You know, I think I skipped over some stuff. So you see that line right there? There's a scripture. Go, go back to Isaiah. Yeah, oh, yeah, Isaiah. All right, here we go. Babylon. Y'all still with me, right? <laughs> Amen. All right, Babylon, this is a judgment that came against Babylon when King Nebuchadnezzar was there. Babylon, a jewel of kingdoms. They were world power at the time. The king of the, the, the jewel of kingdoms, the glory of the Babylonian's pride will be overthrown by God like Sodom and Gomorrah. She will never be. There are some people that saying the, the, the new system is going to be set up. Uh, the the uh, Babylon system headquarters is going to be set up and. Ancient Babylon, not so, because God says not so. All right, here we go. 
She will never be inhabited or lived in through all generations. No Arab will pitch his tent there. No shepherds will rest his flocks there. But desert creatures will lie there. Jackals will fill her houses. There the owls will dwell, and there the wild goats will leap about. Hyenas will howl in, in her strongholds, jackals in her luxury places. Her, her time is at hand, and her days will not be prolonged. So this is actually a, a, a person went and got the measurements of ancient Babylon, and that prophecy has 100% come true. It is desolate. Nobody lives in ancient Babylon, period. All the places right there is outside of ancient Babylon. Keep going. Right there. See people living over there? Over there, desolate. Keep going. Desolate. And these are actual pictures of what's there. Actual pictures of what's going on in ancient Babylon. I think that's a hyena, uh, jackal, owl. That's what the scripture said. Yep. All right. So you can keep going. Spending time in prayer. Here's a, here's a passage. Go ahead. Go. All right. Sometimes something happens when we pray. Powers of evil lose their sway. We gain strength for fear gives way. Therefore, let us pray. Let us pray. Martin Luther King Jr. equated prayer as oxygen to the body. Um, there's a whole bunch of scriptures and passages about time to pray. We don't have to go through all those. Keep going. You can go all the way to studying God's word. We need to study God's word. This will help us, I believe, defeat this Babylonian spirit. Daniel 9, 2, 2 to 3. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, check this out. Understood from the scriptures, according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah, the prophet, that the desolation of Jerusalem would last seven years. So I turned to the Lord God and, and pleaded with him in prayer and petition and fasting and sackcloth and in ashes. And that's where he does the, the, the Daniel fast. But because he knew the scriptures, he knew the pray about you said you were going to free us. It's been 70 years. But Daniel knew his scriptures. Now dare to say he studied his scriptures. Next one. We need to surrender to God, not to the world. Next S. I'm skipping a whole bunch. Yeah. Surrender to God, not to the world. And like we talked about, it seems like the whole world is going in one direction. And the world is, is, has said in many ways, you need to do this or else. You need to do this or else. Well, we don't need to bow down to what the world's saying. Can I get an amen? amen? We need to stay strong. We need to surrender to God, not to the world. And that's what the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. King Nebuchadnezzar had his, had his little statue and they were like, I'm paraphrasing, hey, we respect you, king, and everything, but we're not going to bow. And if God doesn't help us, save us, he's able to do it. <laughs> he's able. Keep going. All right. Last one. We need to spend time in Quantania. Spend time in Quantania. And we talked about that a little earlier, what that is. And for, from the story of Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were together. You, you just get the sense that they were together and that they encouraged each other. And their strength came from that. Check this out. This quote, a powerful example, a powerful example of what quantity should look like can be found in the study of the phrase one another in the Bible. Scripture commands us to be devoted to one another, honor one another, live in harmony with one another, accept one another, serve one another, be kind and compassionate to one another, admonish one another, encourage one another, spur one another on, love one another. Guess what that is? Quantania. And we can't do that. <laughs> we can't do that if we're not 
hanging together and being connected to one another. Here's a quote from a, from a, from a book called Spiritual Community. I really love it. We're talking about things that we need to do to overcome this spirit. In a spiritual community, people reach deep places in each other's heart that are not often or easily reached. They discover places beneath the awkwardness of wanting to embrace and cry and share opinions. They openly express love and reveal fear, even though they feel so unaccustomed to that level of intimacy. When members of a spiritual community reach a sacred place of vulnerability and authenticity, something is released, something good begins to happen, an appetite for holy things is stirred. For just a moment, the longing to know God becomes intense, stronger than all other passions, worth whatever price must be paid for it. Spiritual togetherness, what I call connecting, creating movement, togetherness, and Christ encourage movement towards Christ. I believe that is absolutely essential for us to be strong. In the book of Hebrews, there was, in that time when the, the book was written, the Christians were going through tremendous persecution. But what was the remedy that God gave them for that persecution? He said, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves. Don't forsake it, because that's part of our strength. It's part of our strength. Let's bow our heads.